Awesome. Well, thank you very much for joining. Sorry, I was a bit late. I was having some internet uh, issues with my hotel. Um, so it's my honor tonight to uh, introduce uh, one of the, the up and coming stars and true leaders in our field, Dr. Glenn Gasson. He's been a pioneer. He actually uh, started a, a, his fellowship, um, I think, four or five years before we did. And we've sort of tried to copy him in every respect because he's uh, created literally the top fellowship in, in, in the country in hand surgery. He also is a pioneer, as many of you know, in, in very innovative and many things, but particularly in what he's going to be talking about tonight. So um, really excited to have him here uh, talking to us, teaching us uh, sort of what he's taught the world about uh, reconstruction after amputation. So Glenn, thank you very much. Oh, my pleasure. Hey, Virginia, be quiet for a minute. I'm talking. Sorry, my daughter just just yelling from the top of her lungs. Not that any of y'all would have any uh, similar things at your house, but um. <laughs> Yeah. No, thanks for having me, Eric. It's a blast. And uh, I love what you guys are doing there. Y'all got a fantastic program. All the feedback I get from people interviewing there, it's been all uh, glowing as well. So, so yeah, so like Eric said, I kind of got into, and I'll tell you one thing for the fellows uh, on board is that when I started practice, this is year 16 for me, if day one you had told me that like I'd be real into amputee um, surgery and research, I probably would have said it literally is the dead last thing I would care a thing about. So I'll tell you, as you enter practice, just stay open-minded. You never know what's going to come your way and you're going to gravitate towards. And uh, there's still a lot in hand surgery uh, that's that we can still make a big difference. And I also remember thinking when I first started, like, gosh, wouldn't it have been awesome like to be like in the boys and Bunnell era where like you could just create surgeries all the time. And I remember literally being like, but it sucks because now like everything's been figured out and everything's been discovered because it feels that way when you start, but uh, it really hasn't. So I love this quote. So Virchow, 1865, in the past year, we've been so extensively authorized, approved, inspected, renovated, elevated, visited, consulted, informed, and have completed so many forms, questionnaires, and reports that no medical progress has been made. So I can't even imagine if if uh, Virchow had to go through like the epic transition and stuff we've had to do recently. And uh, I can't imagine he'd be a big fan. But yeah, so this is like what amputees looked like in Virchow's town on the left. And like, here we are now on the right. So it's, it really is amazing. And a lot of this has really been in just like the last 15 to 20 years. So here's just a few cases for y'all to think about, like, what, what would you do in Atlanta? I mean, I'm, and I trained in Atlanta and loved my time there. Uh, and these weren't cases I saw a lot, even at Grady, when they came in, it was treated very differently than what I do now. So, you know, what would you do with this guy? This guy's actually a Hollywood makeup artist that had a pro propane tank explode. He's got this really high transhumeral amputation. He wants to get back to being a Hollywood makeup artist. This guy's a 51 year old dude. His wife was about to get run over by a boat. So he jumped in the water and pushed her underwater and got run over by the prop. And he shows up to our ER with this forum level guillotine amp. He's also a right hand dominant guitarist by trade. This is a guy that caught 39 year old, got his hand caught in an auger, rips off the end of his thumb and his owner three fingers in an industrial accident and wants to get back to work. And then we've, sadly, we've had a terrible run of these. We've got about 16 of these now. Um, quadrilateral amputees from uh, either toxic shock or septic shock that end up with needing four extremity amputations. This is a 35-year-old mother of four. So, you know, how do we optimize these people's function? And if you think about it, amputations historically been viewed as a very ablative procedure and a reconstructive failure. And classically, if patients kept having pain, we just give them medicines or do, quite frankly, just some of the most illogical procedures in history we used to drill holes in people's bones and stuff their nerves in there and things that honestly, that wasn't, I mean, that was when I was in training. So these are things that really made no sense. And it's frequently relegated to like the most junior residents. So when we think about upper extremity amputees, there's 41,000 Americans living with them. And truly, we can't replace the dexterity and sensibility of the human hand with a prosthesis. So just like you guys do, whenever we can, we replant arms. Um, but sometimes that's not really a good option. And if it's not, there is the option of transplant, but it's got a lot of medical risks. You're shortening people's lives um, in an effort to give them better function. So when we think about upper extremity prosthetics, there's basically two types. There's body power, like this guy up top. Um, some of the downsides, you can either control the elbow or the terminal device, but you can't do them at the same time. And it takes a lot of energy to move your shoulder to be able to control those terminal devices. And then we've got these myoelectrics like this lady on the bottom, which are nice, uh, but you're limited by the number of surface electrodes that are available. And again, you can still only move one joint at a time. And oftentimes the control is really not very intuitive either. So 
hopefully at the end of this talk, one of the things you'll recognize is a new way to think about amputation. I now don't think of amputation as an ablative procedure, but it's a reconstructive procedure. Our goal as hand surgeons is to reconstruct the residual limb. And I think it's comical that if you think about it, you have a patient that has like a small finger FTP laceration, you'll fix it. You'll do a tenolysis. You'll put them through 60 hours of therapy to do like 30 degrees of DIP flexion, which is a joke. But then you'll cut somebody's arm off and see them back and take the sutures out and be like, you know what? Find a prosthetist, maybe a pain management doc. Good luck in life. So we've really failed these people for a long time uh, because I, amputation is really a good chance to prevent and or cure chronic pain. And if you do that in the context, particularly of a multidisciplinary clinic and focus on the psychological and physical needs of patients, you can really make a difference in patients that have been ignored for a long time. And none of these surgeries are complicated. So I'll tell you right now, I am not some outstanding microsurgery or anything like that. These are basic surgeries that you already do. So we're all familiar with brachial plexus surgery, peripheral nerve surgery, tetraplegia. Your guys there do a lot of it muscle transfers, pedicled and free. And we're just going to apply the same concepts, but to the residual limb, not to an existing arm. So uh, Todd Kaiken uh, deserves a lot of credit along with the whole team at Northwestern. And um, they're really the ones that first did something called targeted muscle reinnervation. And what they recognize is an above elbow amputees, for example, you only have a biceps and triceps. And one of the problems was you needed to control the elbow flexion extension for a myoelectric prosthesis, but you also wanted to control open and close hand, but you only had two muscles. So they had a great thought of, you know what, the median ulnar and radial nerves are still connected to the brain. They still work. They just don't have an end target. So they came up with this concept of targeted muscle renovation, frequently just called TMR. The, if you're giving the talk on TMR, the term targeted muscle renovation is hard to say. And I think it's hard for uh, learners to comprehend. I tell our residents and fellows, it's just switch innervation. So all, all you're doing is switching the innervation of another muscle. So if we took the biceps and broke it into two heads and switched the innervation of one of the heads from musculocutaneous to median, now that head, when you think close my hand, would would fire. And when you think bend my elbow, the residual other head that's innervated by the musculocutaneous would fire. So they first figured this out, and it's just giving those nerves a purpose that are still there so they're not forming neuromas and causing phantom pain. So I want you to think about the residual muscles and the residual limbs as biologic amplifiers. And that's what they're doing for a myoelectric prosthesis. They're sending a signal to the surface that we can detect and tell a prosthesis to do a function. So all we're going to do is help those biologic amplifiers have more signals. So like I said, the easiest one to think about is an above elbow amputee. They got two heads of biceps. What if we switch one head of biceps, like the median half, in, uh, into uh, hand closure? So they think, close my hand, median nerve will now control that. And what if we took one head of triceps, like the lateral head, and we switched its innervation and put PI in there? Then they think, open my hand, and that head of triceps would fire. And you keep the native innervation of everything else. And then if we want, we can take ulnar and put that into brachialis. So now we've got five signals, whereas before surgery, we had two. And we've gotten rid of the neuroma pain. And so more signals gives us more prosthetic options, and they actually make sense. And they're really intuitive. The patient doesn't have to think, bend my elbow to close their hand. They just think, close my hand, and that muscle fires, and it's detected. As hand surgeons, the other beauty is now we only need M1 function. As long as it quivers, we can detect that with the surface electrodes for the prosthetic. So M1 is a success. You don't have to get M4 or M5. And the other beauty is you can do it years later. So the muscles are still alive. The nerves are still connected to the brain. So you can do it years later, although I will tell you we've seen a lot of advantages to early versus delayed TMR in our patients. So this is the first one I ever did. This is the left arm. Left of your screen is distal. The head's to the right. And so you can see here's the branch to the lateral head of biceps. And in this case, there was two branches to the medial head of biceps. And then we see the continuation of the musculocutaneous nerve. There's lateral and brachial cutaneous right there. And this is branch to brachialis. So now all we're going to do is go get median ulnar nerves, like you see sitting there. And I'm just going to take median. And again, this is not complicated surgery. We're just going to swing it up. 
We're going to cut those two nerves that went to the medial head of biceps. We're going to sew the median nerve into it. And then we're going to take the ulnar nerve and cut the nerve that's going to brachialis and sew the ulnar nerve into the distal stump of that nerve and into brachialis muscle. And we'll do the same thing for PIN and a part of triceps. When you do these nerve coaptations, I love referring to them as a bulldog chihuahua relationship. The nice thing is usually as peripheral nerve surgeons, we've got the chihuahua, but this time you've got the bulldog. So now we've got the big nerve going into the smaller nerve. So the way we technically do our coaptations on the left, you can see it's just an end-to-end neurography with eight or nine O nylon. And then after we've done that, we'll take some 6-0 nylon and we'll sew the epineurium of the donor nerve, in this case, the median nerve, into the epimesium of the donor of the recipient muscle. So we'll take 6-0 and go like right into the muscle. And that is a couple of things. Number one, it makes me feel better. Like as they move their arm around, it's not going to just pull apart with one 8 or 9 nylon. So it gives it better strength, but it also allows the nerve to grow right into that muscle a lot faster. And I'll tell you, we see signal acquisition of these muscles sometimes truthfully as early as six to eight weeks post-op. So it's a lot better. Uh, you'll see people talk about TMR where they just kind of do a nerve to nerve transfer, but it's a long way from the muscle. I personally don't think that's the best way to do it. I think you lose a lot of axons and I don't think it always reliably innervates the muscle. So I think doing it this way, kind of an end to end coaptation and then dunking it right into the muscle is, is my preferred technique. And then afterwards, uh, here's kind of what we do. You can see they're in therapy right out of the gates, edema control. I'll talk a little bit about the role of eye pops. Uh, and then we try to get them by three months starting to get into a prosthesis. And certainly by six months, our goal is that they're re-wearing something. And um, we do follow them for pain, psychology, our clinics, a multidisciplinary clinic that I can allude to later on. So eye pops, this is an old concept called immediate post-operative prostheses. Um, it kind of fell out of favor, but we've really found it helpful for a lot of patients. You can get them in something temporary, like see this guy now, all he has left is a thumb. So you can just give him this little temporary thing. And at least now he can um, eat, he can do more things than he could with that alone. And where it really helps is we use this. You can see here's a actually a forelimb amputee and he was left-handed before surgery. And this is post-op day one. So you can see now he can, he can write, he can uh, eat, he can feed himself. So uh, I also think it improves their long-term utilization rate of prosthetics if you get them in something early. I'm going to briefly touch on this just so you're aware of it. I'm not going to go too deep, but there's two types of myoelectric prosthetics when you get in practice. One is called a direct drive. You also hear this frequently called a dual site system. And what it means is you put one sensor over one muscle to control one function. So for like a transradial amputee, you'd put one over the flexor pronator mass that would control make a fist, and you put one over the extensor supinator mass that would control open the hand. Um, there's ways you can use um, direct drive to really do some neat things. And I'll show you how we use direct drive later on to create the starfish hand where they can move every finger independently because each finger is its own direct drive. So it's its own prosthesis. And this is in contrast to something you'll hear called pattern recognition. Pattern recognition is where you put a socket on somebody that's got all these little electrodes, see all those little dots in there. All those are little surface electrodes. And then you ask the patient, like, make a fist. And, in, or, and instead of it relying on one sensor, it basically sums up the muscle activity recorded by all of those. And then it programs that so that when it sees that pattern of muscle activity, the prosthesis knows to make a fist. And so the nice thing about pattern rec is you can do all sorts of things. You can have somebody do a hang 10 sign, whatever they want to do, as long as they can reproducibly create that signal. But again, you can only do one function at a time. So this is a guy, this is the propane tank guy. So now I've got a band on this guy's arm in the immediate post-op phase. You can see our process is asking him, bend your elbow up and he's doing it. And we're using those surface recognition. Um, so this is like pattern rec in a virtual world. So this is what we do for all of our patients initially. Now I'm asking him make a fist and you can see on the little computer screen, he's able to do it. Training patients in virtual in virtual worlds before they get their prosthesis does two things. Number one, when they get their prosthesis, immediately they know how to use it. Number two, it gives them hope because all these people go through like a big depression. They're really down on life. But when they see that it's working, they get excited about it and they kind of hang in there for you until they get their prosthesis. So here he is now. You'll say, I'll say, bend your elbow. I'm sorry. Here I said, make a fist. You see the medial head of biceps fire? And now I'll say, bend your elbow. 
and you'll see the other head of biceps fire. So it's very visible, the difference. Make a fist, and you'll see that inside head of his biceps fire. So that's what is being picked up on with the prosthesis. And just to show you the difference of what these people can do. So here's a standard non-TMR above elbow amputee on the left, and here's our propane tank guy on the right. And you may notice just a little difference in how these two function. So the guy on the left, his elbow's fixed because he can only control either the elbow or the hand. The guy on the right has multiple degrees of freedom. You can see he can flex extend the elbow, pronate, supinate, grasp and release. And in just a minute, he does my favorite. He picks it up and gives it the 360 degree whirly bird. There it is. And then he's on his way. So um, you can really get a lot more function. This is him now. And bear in mind, this is an above elbow amputee. You're going to see we've done some extra programming for this guy. So now he's actually can use a gyroscope like he just did. Now he's got independent thumb control as an above elbow amputee. You can see him there. So he's actually the first person that went back to work as a Hollywood makeup artist after a transhumeral amputation. He takes zero pain medicine. You can see, look at his different gestures and stuff he can do independently. So I don't know about you guys there, but I think it's it's a really nice outcome for for such a problem. Um, I mentioned earlier, our approach to neuromas has been incredibly illogical over the last hundred years, burying nerves and muscles that are already innervated, drilling ho holes and bones and sticking it in there. TMR actually makes sense because nerves are doing what they're supposed to do. They grow into the muscle and they re a muscle. And if you look at the early studies, 25 to 26, complete relief of their pain. Uh, there's not, there was not uh, a single case report of neuroma after TMR, uh, that in that particular series, the one nerve was a nerve that didn't get TMR. Now, that being said, I will tell you, we have definitely had failed TMRs now that we've done this long enough. We've, uh, we're have we going to come out with our series coming up, a revision TMR surgery and kind of causes of failure that I can talk to you guys later about. And a TMR is a powerful thing. It's really not just for amputees. This is a great case to consider. This got sent to our amputee clinic. She was a 33-year-old who had a Ewing sarcoma resection as a child. She'd had something like 20 surgeries on her leg. And her saf she'd had her saphenous nerve resected to her, like her uh, above her knee, but she kept having so much pain. She got sent for an above knee amputation. And all we did was TMR for her. It was like, that'd be mean to cut her leg off. So we just took saphenous nerve, found a branch to add out her longus and did a, uh, did a TMR for her. And you can see, look at this from a VAS of 10 to a VAS of two in two weeks post-op. And uh, now granted, this is an outlier of like one of our best results, but this is a lady that literally got sent for an amputation and in two weeks had knocked her narcotic pain medicine by two thirds with a VAS of two. I alluded to this earlier, the timing I do think matters. Uh, we've had a lot better results doing early versus delayed TMR. We did not see an increased risk of complications. Uh, they were getting in prostheses earlier, and they were less likely to develop chronic pain in the ones that um, we did early. But it still has a role for late. But I think if you can do them earlier, it's better. All right, so next level, uh, shoulder level TMR. You're basically doing the same thing. It's just that now the muscles change. So donor nerves, we oftentimes have musculocutaneous, median, ulnar, and radial at that level. And now we're going to target medial and lateral heads of pec, and you can do a pedicled pec minor uh, to have it be a recipient as well. I would say if you're thinking about starting TMR and you haven't done it, this is not what I would make your, your first case. These cases are truly brutal. Uh, here's a couple of neuromas. You can see these are way up under the clavicle. You can see these median and ulnar nerve neuromas that are a little over an inch each, and they are just plastered to the subclavian artery. So a real pain in the ass of a dissection, but the lady felt a ton better afterwards. And um, here's a case. This is a right shoulder. Head would be the top of the screen. This patient had a little residual biceps. That's what I'm stimulating right there. Uh, and now you can see we're going to go to the lower portion of pec right here the sternal head of pec, and then we'll go to the clavicular head of pec next. So those are going to be my targets for this um, high transhumeral. Here's clavicular head of pec. And then it's just the same thing. I mean, it, it literally just becomes a nerve transfer case at this point. But once you've done it, you can see now, in this case, we went um, musculocutaneous to the upper part of pec. This isn't the case I just showed, and you'll see the upper part of his pec fire there. And now we did median to the lower part of his pec. And when we ask him to make a fist, you'll see the lower part of his pec firing. So now this guy can control elbow and hand as a almost shoulder dysartic level patient. The other thing you'll notice we have him do and we have all our patients do is bilateral motions. When you're training them how to do this, have them do it bilaterally to be able to demonstrate that. And they're showing radial to the pedicle pec minor. 
So forearm level, um, this is kind of what a standard forearm myoelectric prosthetic looks like. You can say they can control, grasp, and release. This is that dual site system I told you about earlier. But if he wants to do like thumb opposition, he has to reach up and grab it like that. If they want to do pro soup, they got to reach up with their other hand and reposition it. If you have to do that to grab something, you're never going to use the prosthetic hand. Like that's totally useless. So it's crazy that this day and age, that's what we're giving patients. Um, now, forearm's really different because one thing about a forearm level amputation, unlike shoulder and above elbow, which I just showed you, you've got a million muscles. So if you think about a mid forearm amp, you've got your entire flexor pronator, entire extensor supinator. So really for forearm, I would think of it differently. It is mainly neuroma prevention because pretty much everything else, thumb opposition, pro soup, wrist flexion, extension pinch, you can do pattern rack and different things to get those functions. So I think of this one a little bit different than the higher levels because we're really doing it for uh, for pain control, which was a philosophical change for me. When I started, some of Brian and I's early stuff we published was on like supinator to break your radialis to get a better supinator signal and all these like interposition graphs because it gave us beautiful signals. But what we realized later on is that you have all these great signals, but the prosthetic can still only do a finite number of things and it couldn't harness all the power of the surgery. So we've really kind of dumbed down our forearm level amputee surgeries where we do TMR for median and ulnar nerves to prevent neuromas. And when they, we do RPNI for radial sensory and or LABCN, I'm not going to go too much into RPNI, but if you're not familiar with it, it's very simple. You just cut out a free, maximally sized three by one by one centimeter muscle graft and just wrap it around the end of the nerve like a little burrito and then stuff the nerve somewhere deep. And so the nerve will grow into that free muscle graft. It lives like a skin graft by the same three principles. And that's kind of all you have to do. I don't love RPNI uh, as much as TMR because you don't get a signal that you can use if you're trying to control a prosthesis. And I do think you're limited by how many axons it can harness as a free graft. So I think it's fine for like radial sensory, but if you're going to use it for a big nerve like median, you'd probably have to split it into like at least three groups of fascicles because I don't think you can harness the entire median nerve with just a three by one by one centimeter graft. So um, the targets for TMR in the forearm are very non-prescriptive. Uh, we're just about to publish a study now that is really showing us that the safest way to do it is to send your signals as distal and as deep as possible. Proximal and superficial signals seem to have a higher rate of neuroma recurrence in our hands at least. So now we I'll show you coming up, we really like to use like pronator quadratus in a pedicled fashion and FPL because it's really distal and deep are our two favorite targets now. We used to use uh, FCR, pronator teres, FDS. Uh, the very beginning, I used to owner to FCU thinking like, oh, it's right there. But those always got, that's the worst target you can use because it's right also where the prosthesis squeezes, if you think about it. Like if you're molding a cast, that mold is kind of right there. So if you think about how these prosthetics sit, you really don't want your targets to be right where the prosthesis is squeezing. So if you're distal and deep, you're, you're kind of saved from that. So this is literally how we did them in the very beginning. You can see this huge approach, uh, very open, trying to separate signals, totally unnecessary. Uh, we've learned a lot since then. Uh, now we basically will do all this through the single distal fish mouth incision. And this is what that kind of looks like. So this is a lady that had a bad hand injury and um, you can see now the, at the bottom, those are the RPNI, the radial sensory, those two little uh, free muscle graphs. And in the top right, you can see pronator quadratus that we've pedicled and we've done median into that. And if you extend your incision just a little bit up, um, usually about 10 centimeters above uh, where you would typically do your uh, pronator quadratus coaptation, that's where you'll get to the distal branch of FPL. So you can just follow AIN up the form until you see the FPL branch and then just stimulate it with a nerve stimulator. So we'll do ulnar to FPL, median into a pedicled pronator quadratus, and then you keep everything in that distal incision. So there's not a single proximal incision. And uh, that's really helped us with neuromas and I mentioned this earlier. This is a guy at six weeks on the left. You can see he's already getting signals. This is the old Myo Pro that we used to use to detect signals in the clinic. Now we have them hook up an app to their phone. They can go home with these bands, as you see on the right, and they can practice different gestures. And so, as I mentioned, we have all of our patients learning how to train their hands in a virtual world as early as about six to eight weeks until they get their prosthesis. You can see they're already learning how to do uh, digital control, thumb control uh, at only about uh, eight weeks in that case. So this is the guy, um, 
This is one of the earliest ones we did. And you can see uh, this is the first day he's ever put it on. But just by training in a virtual world, he's got great control day one. You can also see where that prosthesis is squeezing him up by his elbow. See where that is? You can imagine if you did TMR up into his elbow. Look where the squeeze is. It's right on the flexor pronator sensor supinator mass. So if you can dodge those as your targets, again, I really think it helps. And here's the guy that got run over by the boat. So no talks complete without kind of giving some of your show off cases, but here he is back playing guitar. Um, so our first transradial results here, they were uh, at six months, BAS of less than one, average contractions palpable under three months, and not a single post-operative neuroma. And I think one of the things it's most impressive. And I do think some of this is biased just because we have a very big multidisciplinary clinic, but 75% were regularly wearing a prosthesis by six months. And I'll tell you that number normally for transradials hovers around literally 15 to 20%. So that's, that's a big, big difference um, that we were able to achieve. So lower extremity TMR, we do this as well. Uh, there's a lot of groups in the country doing this for like everybody. I personally do not think this is indicated for your vasculopath, diabetic. They they can't feel the foot that you're cutting off. So I really don't see a lot of symptomatic aromas in my practice. Uh, the last time we looked it up, our last 200 diabetic peripheral neuropathy BKAs, we had had two cases of symptomatic neuromas. So I don't think that justifies doing it on everybody. And I think if that happens, we're going to see that getting denied down the road. So, but for the younger trauma patients or patients with symptomatic neuromas, we'll frequently do TMR of perineal and lateral gastroc, distal tibial and the soleus. And then we'll do RPNI for the cutaneous nerves of the lower leg. You don't want to denervate five muscles in the lower leg to do TMR of all the nerves. So I, we try to be selective and just use the big ones for TMR and the smaller ones for RPNI. And here's our four extremity lady. She's the first one that we did upper and lower extremity TMR at the time of primary amputation. This is her nine months post-op. She gets up in the morning, puts on all four prostheses, makes her kids breakfast and doesn't take any pain medicines. In terms of the future, this is some of the coolest things coming down. We've got NIH grant with um, Case Western, a guy named Dustin Tyler for implantable sensory electrodes. One of the knocks on prosthetics is that you can't feel them, which has historically been true. But this is the first generation we came up with where you can see we put nerve cuffs around the median and ulnar nerves, and he literally has wires that come out of his shoulder and he plugs into his prosthesis and you can touch like his thumb. And he's like, I feel you touching my thumb. And the new generation of this that we're going to start Q4 of this year's Bluetooth. So now we'll have Bluetooth sensory control for prosthesis. So I could literally take your prosthesis in the other room and touch the finger and you'd be like, they'd be like, you're touching the middle finger of my prosthesis that they're not even wearing at the time. So the Bluetooth sensory control is going to be kind of mind blowing. And just to let you know how important it is, this is a really cool video. This guy was just on 60 Minutes about um, two months ago as well. And uh, this is him holding his wife's hand for the first time seven years later after he lost his hand. And you get a real sense of the power of sensory. It meant the world to him. It's a really, it's really cool. Um, so what do I think the future of all this is going to be? Uh, so when I said like, we're going to make cyborgs, so this is really it. So osteo integration is something we've been doing here now as well. Uh, it's great for these very, look at this high transhumeral, very difficult to fit a prosthesis on somebody like that. So I think down the road, when you've got osteo integrated prosthesis with Bluetooth sensory and motor control, you really might have a situation where we look at things 20 years from now and say, is there even a role for replants anymore of like arms? Like, you know, none of us have patients that can do these things. If you have sensate prosthetics with perfect control, osteo integrated, I don't know. It's going to be interesting to see where the future goes. I'm going to spend just a little time here now talking to you guys about partial hand amputees because all the stuff I just did super cool, but we don't see as many of those as all y'all do for partial hands. We see all the time. So, you know, what are the prosthetic options? You've got these silicones that look nice, but they don't do much these durable metal passive devices, some little 3D printed things and some myoelectrics. So here's an example. It's one of our patients above. Well, that's the same hand. So that's with and without a silicone prosthesis. So these really look great. 
if you want to order them for your patients, just word of caution, don't ever dictate like a cosmetic device in your note or it'll never get covered. Quote unquote, your note will state that you want your patient to have a passive functional prosthesis. And then you're going to order a silicone device and that's what they get uh, because they are functional. They got little wires. You can like bend them in, in different positions. Uh, they're not overly functional. And they are very expensive and patients do prefer them for cosmetic reasons, but just don't put that in your note. These things are great. These are, uh, we call them Titan fingers. They're metal ratcheting digits. I've got a lot of people that work construction using these. I've also got a guy uh, that does, is like a big, uh, what do you call it? Like this orange theory kind of fitnessy people. So he does like pull-ups with these on. So he's only got a thumb and one finger and he locks over there on the bar and can do pull-ups and stuff. So these are really good for uh, your high uh, laboring type person. Uh, here's an example of a guy that he, all he had is a thumb. You can see all we gave him was a single digit. And just adding one metal passive device lets him do a lot of functional tasks he couldn't do otherwise. Um, there's these body-driven prosthesis. The most popular company is a company called Naked Prosthetics. Um, and the phrase is, if you can put a ring on it, then you can put one of these on it. So if you're deciding like it's a PIP level amp or a P1 amp. Is it even worth saving, quote unquote, that much P1? Uh, just remember the adage, if you can put a ring on it, it's enough to save. If you can't put a ring on it, then it's not very functional and you may be better off with a Ray amp. And here's what they got a little thumb driver you can see down there on the bottom as well. And then there's myoelectrics. The problem with most myoelectrics is that you can't detect the intrinsics other than first DI and hypothenar. So for the classic ones, they have to think like, abduct my index finger to open them and like abduct my small finger to close them. Uh, the nice thing is you don't need your other hand to control them, but so the control's non-intuitive. And so patients really haven't used them classically. So how do we approach these partial hands? Like all the trauma you see, first off, get fracture stability, use fusions as needed to get uh, bony stability initially. And then you want to create a stable soft tissue envelope and one of the biggest frustrations I've had over the years of seeing patients in our clinic is the classic teaching when I went through was that you need durable soft tissue coverage. So it was like groin flaps and abdominal flaps and all these just huge things. And you end up like this guy in the middle with like these boxing gloves that are completely non-functional that have great durable coverage. I would tell you that we've moved to the absolute other extreme. We use the thinnest possible coverage we can. And if it breaks down and I need more durable coverage, I'll do it later. But most of what we do is like on the right, like just integer in a skin graft, even on exposed bone, at most, maybe a random pattern chest wall flap that's thinned at the time. But I would caution you to, uh, to do some of these larger classic ones. And you'll hear people say like, you can always go back and debulk it and all this. But the problem is those patients have like four surgeries over the course of a year to a year and a half. And by then they just don't use their hand. They just have become opposite hand dominant. For central digits, I do like transposition. There's a lot of ways to do them for ring finger transpositions because there's no extrinsics attaching to the base of the ring finger, unlike the other three digits. You can just take the whole ring finger out at the CMC joint and then push the fifth into the fourth facet of the hamate and just pin that for about four weeks and that'll close the gap beautifully. For long finger amps, it's a little harder. I tend to favor a bony transposition of the index onto the long. Some people like this is the case, one of the cases I tried back in the day, a tightrope, which seemed to work fine for this particular patient. So I don't think there's one absolute way to do it. Here's an example. You can see just a bony transposition. I like an IM screw for these. Uh, and just close that space down so I don't have stuff falling in between their fingers. Another big thing is optimizing length for these pressure-induced necrosis. I'll tell you, just keep waiting. Don't do these early. Because if you look on the left, see where the pink was originally? The eschar on this patient, like three months prior to surgery, was way back there, like kind of proximal P1 level. And we just waited and waited and waited. And then when you go back and do their amps, she never even used a prosthesis. So we were able to maintain enough length on her by just waiting long enough to salvage improved length. So don't, don't rush into these. I always tell patients it's like a loose tooth. Just wait till it's just about ready to fall off and then take it off. Don't go early. Um, and even a little, little bit of length goes a long way. It's a guy I love showing his case. Look, all he's got is like a PIP disartic of his pinky. Um, but we were able to keep that and just did a skin graft. You'll notice there's no big flap for coverage. And look how functional he is just with that. So all he ended up needing was just a little thumb opposition post. And he's really functional just with that. So a small amount of length can be a huge gain for these patients.
What about short thumbs? These are obviously tough. Uh, a lot of times we see short thumbs, it's in the context they've lost their thumb and part of their index finger. And on top plasty, which is basically just a policization, but at the same level, just scooch over uh, what's left of the index finger on top of the thumb. Uh, that's been a really nice thing that we've enjoyed. Here's a lady you can see. We ray amped her index and scooch it over on top of the thumb. And uh, here she is just two months out, and she doesn't use a prosthesis on this hand. She's become super functional now uh, with that lengthened thumb, and that gives them a nice first web space. And if you still can't get enough length, of course, you can do distraction osteogenesis. You can gain about almost an inch on the thumb with that. Uh, if you do an MP level, one thing that's kind of weird, if you look at this kid, look how big the end of his thumb looks. Because if you look at your own thumb, the MP joint is the widest part of your thumb. So if you have an MP disartic and you lengthen it, then the widest part is the most distal part. So it always looks kind of bulbous like this. So what do we do with the nerves in partial hand amputee? So primarily, we I still just do traction neurectomy for almost all of them. When I get way down in the hand, like metacarpal level, then I will tend to do an RPNI for those primarily. But if it's out in the digit, I just do traction neurectomy. If I'm dealing with the symptomatic neuroma, we have been using palm TMR for that. You can see this lady's got three pretty big spring onions right there. And uh, lumbrical is a great target because it's really superficial. It's easy to get to. So we've been doing palm TMR to lumbrical. Here's an example. This is a cop that got her thumb bit off by a dog, couldn't use her gun. You can see she really hurts right there. We went in and found a uh, nerve to lumbrical. Remember, that comes off the digital nerve, innervates the lumbrical, and then you just take the symptomatic neuroma, cut it out, and it's the same thing, a little nerve transfer right in the nerve to lumbrical. She went back, and there was her little, she gave us a little shooting target she got when she went back on the force and returned to the force three months later. And then lastly, I want to tell you about uh, what we came up with, something called the starfish procedure. For these partial hand amputees, one of the things Brian and I wondered is, you know, why can't we get patients with better control? Because nothing that we have that I've showed you so far is really what any of us would want if we had a multi-digit amputation. Uh, so we developed this called the starfish procedure. And the thought was, if you imagine a patient with four MP dysartics, the intrinsics are still there. All your volar and dorsal are still down in your hand. They've still got a nerve and blood supply. They're still connected to your brain. And the problem is you just can't detect them with the surface electrode. So all we thought is like, why not just move them to a superficial location? That way they could provide a signal. So this is, I love this drawing. So I actually drew this out on a cocktail napkin in the surgeon's lounge originally when Brian and I were talking about the concept. And this was the idea of just moving the dorsal neurosii to a superficial location where surface electrodes could detect them. And then theoretically, if it worked, you could then make each finger its own prosthesis and patients could have independent digital control. But we didn't even, first of all, I didn't even know where the nerve to the dorsal neurosius was, and there was no books to tell you where it was. So we went to the cadaver lab first and we kind of dissected out the intrinsics. And if, if you do that and you pedicle the intrinsics on their uh, neurovascular pedicles, this is what it looks like. And so we decided it looked like a starfish. And since starfish are famous for their ability to regenerate lost limbs, we called this the starfish procedure. So schematically, this is all it is. If you just took the like the second and fourth dorsal neurosius, for instance, and transposed them dorsally, then put a little barrier in between so you didn't get myoelectric crosstalk. Then you could put a sensor over each one of those. Each sensor could run its own prosthetic finger. And theoretically, you could get uh, independent digital motion. So this is what it looks like doing a starfish. You can see we've raised the skin. I'm going to find the extrinsic extensor tendons because those are going to be my little buffer in between. And now you just come sharply down on bone, and I'm just going to free up the interossei like you see here, straight off of the metacarpal. The pedicle enters them basically about the level of the proximal metaphyseal diaphyseal flare. So you really don't want to be proximal into the metaphyseal region. There's no reason to be there. Then you're going to take off three centimeters of the metacarpal heads. That just leaves room. We're really efficient here in Charlotte. If you see how quick we operate, it's how we are. Um, and basically that gives you room for the individual myoelectric fingers. And then this is probably the most important step. Don't forget that at each interface, you have a volar and a dorsal interosseous, but they go to different fingers. So in the second web space, you've got your first volar interosseous going to your index finger and your second dorsal interosseous going to your middle finger. So if you just moved them both up there, 
then it'd be hard for the prosthesis to know which finger you're wanting to control. So you just got to pick one per finger. So typically we'll do the second DI for the long finger and we'll do the fourth DI for the ring finger. So here it is showing that. Here's my second DI. I'm going to reflect that more radially. Then I'm going to take my fourth DI and I'm gonna reflect that more ownerly. Put my little barrier in between so that there's clean signals and they're not over talking each other. Close up shop. And I love this video. This is my hand opening and closing. You see how I can't control the prosthesis because I haven't had a starfish procedure. And here's our guy just two weeks post-op. You can see right away these are working. So he's getting signals. Now, this prosthesis doesn't have individual fingers, but he can do it right away. And here's the first guy we ever did it on. I'm going to say move your middle finger, and you'll see the bulge from his second DI. Now move your ring finger. You'll see the bulge of his fourth DI. And now move your small finger, and you'll see his hypothenars. And then... So then we brought him to the office, and this is the first time anyone in the world has ever done independent finger control. So we brought him in and said, you know, hooked him up and said, move your middle finger. He's had zero training. And he does it. Now I say, move your ring finger. It takes him a second to think about it. And then he does his ring finger. And I say, do your small finger. Brian and I are like jumping around in the background. This dude's like, it's no big deal. And uh, then we're asking him to move all his fingers. And he's able to do every single one of them with absolutely zero training. So it's super intuitive. And this is the first prototype we made him. It's funny, the insurance wouldn't cover it. So Brian and I actually put in our own, we donated 25 grand just to get this built to be the first person ever. And then do your small fingering. See, he does every one of these independently. And then this is him now. So now he's got absolute seamless control of every single finger. He can pick up a 20 pound dumbbell, pick a flowery. He loves his weed eater, car doors. He's got unbelievable control. So we've done... Actually, now, I need to update the slide. We've done just over 30. I think we've done 31 of these now. And so far, every single person has independent control. This is the first active duty soldier that we did that got sent up. And uh, you can see the fidelity is unbelievable that these patients can get. So they all love showing off what they can do. Uh, independent long finger extensions, one of the more popular gestures. They like to let us know that they're capable of doing here in Charlotte. And uh, here's just a look at some of the starfishes we've done. And uh, it's, you can see a, just a, a nice array of different things that it's really good for. And some of them, like you may look at the guy on the bottom left and be like, why does that guy really even need a starfish? That looks pretty functional as is. Uh, believe it or not, that guy's from Florida. He's a sign language interpreter was his job. So he actually had to have independent finger control to go back to his original job. Uh, he lost it, like saving his wife's life when she was trying to commit suicide and shot through his hand, trying to kill herself. It's a harrowing tale, but, um, Anyways, here's kind of a bonus case to leave you guys on. So this is a 39-year-old. He came to us a year out from a partial hand amputation. She'd had multiple tenolysis. Her fingers were insensate. So she came to us for a, a transradial level amputation. But interestingly, all of her intrinsics when we did an EMG were still there. And it was like, I wonder if we could do this. So she's. we've done two of these just to, for kind of proof of concept. So we did what we call our pedicled starfish. So we kept radial ulnar arteries, median ulnar nerve contributions to every one of the intrinsics and reflected that back into the residual limb. And then we did um, TMR of the sensory nerves into a pedicled PQ. And so for her in a virtual world, she can control every finger and her thumb independently as a transradial amputee. Now, they haven't figured out how to make a prosthesis that can do all that yet, but she's surgically wired to do it. So uh, I don't know what the future holds, but it might hold something like that. A few other final uh, teaching points. So when I was going through training, the teaching was if someone had every digit cut off, your number one priority is to put the thumb back on, and that's still the case. The number two priority was taught to put on a more ulnar ray because it gave you a broader span and you could use the hand better. I will tell you that we've changed that in our own practice. So the problem with a hand like this is you can't give them any prosthetic because it blocks the thumb getting to that ulnar ray. So they have to use it as it is. So it's super functional for things that are tiny and less than like a half pound. But if they want to lift anything more than a pound, they can't do it. So now we've really switched and we'll do thumb and then index number number two, because now they can pinch and do all the same fine motor skills that the patient before can, but you can give them three owner digit starfishes on top of that. So now they can run a myoelectric prosthetic for the owner side. So this guy can carry like six bags of groceries and the owner three figures, and then still have a key between his thumb and index to unlock the door. So they're a lot more functional, in my opinion, giving them uh, working from radial to owner in terms of your sequence of replants.
Another nice thing is if you can ever do this in the context of a multidisciplinary clinic, this is one of my favorite pictures on the left is the first guy that had the starfish procedure, counseling the second guy that has starfish procedure on what it's like to go through. And on the right is one of our veterans counseling the first pediatric starfish we ever did on what it's like, pearls for success, things you can't do if these people are just blended into like carpal tunnel and trigger fingers in your office. So for the fellows and uh, any residents that are out there, I'll tell you right now, the sky's the limit. So know your prosthetic options, maximize boning length, give them thin coverage, prevent and manage neuromas, and then just don't burn bridges. And remember the options like starfish, sensory. We've got a lot of things we can do now that we couldn't used to do. So I'll tell you to consider, come on over and give this stuff a try, because at least in Charlotte, it seems to work out okay uh, in our hands. So. Thanks for the opportunity uh, to talk on that and uh, reconnect with you guys in memory. So appreciate it. I remember my time being at Grady too, by the way, on Ortho B as the uh, as the PGY four at Atlanta Medical Center, doing my due diligence down there, and uh, still have some fond memories. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's probably probably the same. Probably hasn't changed a whole lot. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, no, that that was incredible. Like absolutely incredible. Thank you, thank you very much, um, Tom, Joe. Y'all want to interface with uh, Dr. Gaston? So Tom and Joe are two pals I've been introduced already. Um, yeah, I talked to Tom a little bit earlier. Joe was on. Uh, Tom and I were catching up. He's heading to KU yeah. next year, right here after his yes. Boston time, and he's agreed to be at least an honorary dog fan for football season. <laughs> absolutely, and, and <laughs> un unbelievable talk. Thank you for your time, Dr. Gaston. Um, I have a couple questions. Um, yeah. Number one, I think uh, for your trans radial amputations, I, I guess like a particular technical question, how do you do your uh, your median to AIN uh, TMR, particularly with the size mismatch? Um, and then how do you manage the ulnar nerve after? I've had a couple of those cases this year, and I'm curious as to your technique about how to accomplish that, whether you're wrapping it in additional muscle given the the mismatch. Um, and I guess number two, a question uh, particular to Grady, we see a lot of, you know, index amputations and and we we see a lot of replants that, you know, are, are towing the boundaries of, uh, of whether or not we should replant it. And given how we're pushing uh, the boundaries of myelectric prostheses and and the future of... Um, of all of this, how, how do you counsel patients on to whether or not to replant? Because I, I think we're, we're appropriate at Grady in terms of our indications, but I'm wondering about how you counsel your patients, not knowing what the future holds in terms of prostheses. Yeah, good, real good question. So for the first one, for me, forum level, the first fork in the road in the decision is, is, is PQ available and viable? So like if it's like a radiocarpal kind of disartic that you're converting into a transradial, that's one category. Like mangled, non-reconstructable hand or uh, gangrenous hand, but still has viable PQ. If they have a viable PQ, you just detach PQ, leave anterior neurosis artery nerve into it at first and reflect it proximally. Do your amputation. Then you cut AIN as it's going into PQ and so median into the distal little stump of AIN and then wrap PQ around the rest of median nerve. That's all hand or median. Then if you just follow AIN proximally in the forearm and you extend the medial limb of your fish mouth about an extra eight to 10 centimeters, you'll find that branch to FPL. It's the most distal branch. Cut the branch to FPL and owner easily goes to that. So that's my recipe for that one. And then I'll do... Um, just an RP and I radial sensory nerve. If it's a case where PQ is not available, the amputation is already above proximal level of PQ or it's non-viable, then do your standard fish mouth distally, trace AIN proximally, and you'll find FPL branch and then just proximal to it. Sometimes all very close to the same level, you'll see the branch to FDP um, to index and long. And then I'll do median and ulnar into those two. So because I'm doing them right at the my uh, at the motor entry point, you're cutting it with just like a tiny little stump of a few millimeters to sew end to end nerve and then nerve straight to muscle. So that's how we'll do those. Now, if it's more proximal than that and I'm in the proximal form, then you're going to your other targets. Um, 
Okay. Still try to get them deep nowadays. We used to do superficial thinking I wanted the signals to be near the skin because I was trying to produce signals, not realizing that really with form, they've got enough signals. So just send them deep and minimize your risk of neuroma. So now I'll do like deep head of or teres, um, things like that that are a little bit deeper for us. For the other question about at Grady, what would I do? So I think a lot, to, you know, I think whenever we can, we still favor replant for particularly above, you know, multiple fingers, arm, things like that. I would always replant pretty much anything you could. So that would be the first thing. Um, if you're having to do an index amp because it's an unsalvageable limb or a failed replant, if it's a young active person with fewer medical comorbidities, even if they don't have all the resources right now, we will still do TMR for them. I mean, if you give me some homeless guy that gets run over by a train drunk at, here to, tonight, I would still do TMR because then if down the road their situation does change, they can get a myoelectric later. So we'll still do it just to kind of tee them up, A, for the future, but then B, just for neuroma prevention and the decreased you know, risk of opioid abuse and everything else, we'll still do it. But I think in the Grady patients, if you can do a successful replant, probably, honestly, most of them don't have a lot of resources anyway. So very few of the Grady patients are going to be wearing myoelectrics anyway. So if you can give them a, a limited functional hand with some sensation, that's probably better than what they're going to get otherwise, truthfully. Sure. Sure. Do you, um, how do you, how do you think of replants in 2024 in terms of digital function, you know, utilizing cell phones, modern technology, obviously you've innovated tremendously in terms of myoelectrics and the, and the starfish, you know, do, do you have the same sort of paradigm that is traditionally taught to orthopedic and plastic surgery residents in terms of how do you utilize a prosthesis? Probably on board stuff we do. I mean, like if you give me like a thumb amp, I'm always going to try that. Pediatric fingers, I'm always going to try. Multi digits, I'm going to try unless they're way out like DIPs, you know. But if you give me, you know, a four finger amp, I'm going to try to get back on at least index plus minus middle. Yeah. Um, but I suck at doing replants, one of the truth. My personal success rate is probably 50% of my replants live. Of the ones that live, maybe two thirds are reasonably functional and happy with them. And at least a third of the ones that do live don't like it anyway. So um, I don't, I think though, if you compare ours to places that do a ton, like if you look at some of them out of Asia, they, I'm convinced they do better than ours. I really do think they do more and they do better, but I'm not that good at them, to be honest with you. <laughs> Yeah, I mean it's it's Probably really doing as a fellow. I suck at doing replants. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I mean, amazing talk, and um, your work is a total tour de force. So, thank you, Thanks, um, Dr. Gaston. That hey, I'm I'm Joe. I didn't get to meet you earlier. Um, that was really really cool. That was one of the first talks that I think I've gotten really excited about in a long time in terms of where we're going in the future. Um, I've got just kind of an overarching systems question for you. So it seems like getting something like this going, there's a lot of parts that probably won't be there already. So you need one for us to develop the technical skill to do these things that we don't see. Um, you need a prosthetist who's familiar with this stuff. You need therapists who know how to do this stuff. You need implant companies who are willing to play ball and people who can manage the insurance companies. And it seems pretty daunting honestly going into practice and just you know yeah. feeling like i want to offer this to my patients but um it just seems like a lot to try and figure out uh, as you're building a practice what tips do you have for trying to get into this yeah it's a great one so a couple of things number one if it's an area once you get into practice or even before that you're like you know what i there's no one in my region doing this and i really really want to do it Brian and I do have once a month uh, people around the country fly in and learn how to they spend the whole day with us. We do uh, lectures the night before, cadaver lab in the morning. They're with us for the clinic and they're with us in the OR. And um, it's free. We pay for everything to, just so that other people can learn and take it to their communities. So that's one option if it's something you really get passionate about. The technical part's easy. I mean, truthfully, you could you could just send me a you could text me the day before you do one, and we could talk about it and you could do it. It's not hard surgery. Uh, the other parts are tricky. So the therapists, you do have to find someone locally that knows what they're doing. Um, the prosthetists, most places have at least one prosthetic company that's 
reasonably has, has at least some experience with it. So that's usually obtainable. The prosthetics is a problem too, though, to your point. So one of the things we got the most frustrated about is you always great surgeries and they can't get the prosthetics and I'm sure and stuff. So on top of it all, we actually ended up about six years ago, starting our own 501 C3 called arms for all. So Brian and I go out and raise money every year. And then we donate between two and five prosthetics a year to our patients that can't afford them. So that's been super gratifying as well. And I'm happy to give you pearls on that. If you ever get to that stage of interest with it. Very cool. Thank you. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. I was going to say how, how from the um, resources standpoint, so is, is that that's a lot of these patients, I'm assuming right, being able to pay it themselves, they can't totally finance it. And, and I'm assuming insurances are, have not kind of come around a whole lot to this at this point. Not as far as we'd like, you know, we did luckily, um, Brian and I did meet finally after like six years of asking for it. We met with the CEO of Blue Cross and Anthem and asked them if we could rewrite their policy about prosthetics. And they actually allowed us to. So we rewrote the policy for Blue Cross and Anthem. Um, but then when they presented to their board uh, for this year, for 2024's coverage, they decided to table that one for now out of cost concerns. Um, but they've still got the policy we wrote. They just didn't implement it in 2024. They say that they might in 2025. So one of the areas we focused our nonprofit on, you know, most of it's just donating prosthetics, but the other part of it is advocacy trying to, I think it's going to take that. I think it's going to take us and others that get interested in this subfield to really get policy changes. Cause I mean, it's crazy outdated, right? Like, can you imagine like if you're mom lost her arms both arms and they said like here's some hooks you'd be like you got to be kidding me like there's no way this day and age that can be the answer so it's just going to take effort of lobbying and there's just you know it's like orphan diseases in medicine it's just it's hard it just takes work and you just got to find people that are passionate and they're going to do it so i think we'll get there but we're not there yet and one last question um you know congratulations on the nh funding my my assumption would be this would be a ripe one for dod funding have y'all pursued that avenue or are you yeah we have and they dod's got so we've got a couple of different grants that have to do with dod funding for it we just submitted a pecori grant as well for uh some of our work with this and um that's so awesome. we're, yeah they're in progress that's awesome that's awesome well really really amazing stuff absolutely amazing stuff uh got you agree anybody else have anything they want <laughs> Hey, yeah, I've got a couple questions. Um, again, that was amazing. Um, first one is, do you find that most of your patients are local or do they travel from all over because they kind of know that you do this? And are a lot of them, you know, military service people or is it a mix? Yeah, so they started out all local. Um, we started the clinic, I guess, about eight years ago and they were all local then. Now, probably two thirds are still local and about a third travel. Now they call, we do get patients from pretty far away. I mean, routinely California, Arizona, New York, a few internationals are just starting to trickle in. So now it's a lot of that, but it's still probably two thirds local, truthfully. Um, mm -hmm. Military, not as much. They tend to keep the military in the military. We got the mm -hmm. unactive duty service member because there wasn't anybody in the military doing starfish at the time. We've trained a couple now, so they'll probably keep them. Um, we consult with them some, like we just went and did grand rounds at center for the intrepid, uh, down in San Antonio. So we still stay in touch with the military with stuff. Um, but they like to try to keep it in the military. We even, it's crazy. Brian and I were like, you know, what? we'll do a free clinic at the VA. You don't have to pay us. We'll just do it for free. Cause we love it. And it's, how about this for how effed up our military is? They're like, you know what? We could do that. As long as you're willing to pledge, uh, five eighths of your time in a week, we will let you do that. I'm like, I'm, I'm offering free service and you want five, eight. I was like, what is five eighths of a week to begin with? So it's like, you know, whatever, like 30 hours a week. I was like, I can't give you 30 hours a week, but so yeah. Oh yeah. I, I spend two days a week at the VA. I, I pledge four eighths of my, my time <laughs> to the VA. So I totally understand that and how uh, ridiculous it is. My second question is how your uh, how your clinic is structured. Um, who do you have in your clinic? And is this like a once a month clinic, once every other week? Or, or how often are you doing it? And what kind of equipment do you have there too? 
Yeah. So our clinic is two half days a month. And then in the clinic, we've got Loughlin and I are the two surgeons. We have prosthetists, 